let's let's crack on because we've got such a tight agenda. So we are thrilled to have such excellent speakers today. And today is the start of our conversation of how we can work together to improve exercise referral in Surrey and also of exploring how we make it work better for those it's best suited for, which most often is those with a long term condition. So evidence shows us that it's key to have a broad offer when you're doing exercise referral schemes. We know the inactive have got the most to gain and we know the inactive are hard to get active. I think we're, we're probably all really aware of that. And you pointed out some key challenges out... when you were registering. If, when you were registering for this um, webinar, and that's been really helpful. And these include how to get funding, improve return on investment, how to get qualified and experienced staff, how to promote programmes to get referrals. Um, GDPR came out as a big issue. GP buy in improving engagement from the unmotivated, managing inequalities and uniformity of offers in a certain place. Um, and I hope some of these will be addressed through the course of this webinar. Please just make sure you can put yourself on mute so that nobody else can hear the background noise. That'd be great. We're asking you to please put questions in the chat and we and the speakers will endeavour to endeavour to answer this throughout the webinar. Um, and we're also really keen to know from you what you want next after this. So as I say, this is just the start of our, our discussions. So please use the chat to let's, let us know as and when you get some thoughts throughout the webinar. So just a bit of background. Active Surrey is part of a national network of 43 active partnerships. We are the active partnership for Surrey. Um, we're funded in part by Sport England. We sit in Surrey County Council, but we're self-governed with our own objectives and our own strategy. And movement for strategy, movement for change is our strategy. And the focus of that is tackling inequalities and inactivity, which tend to go hand in hand. We work where the need is greatest. So you'll see on the slide there, we work in three main ways with systems, people and places. Some of our delivery programmes can be seen on the slides, but we work heavily on strategy. Um, we're split into three teams, community, education and health. In our health team, our aim is that residents are more active to prevent long term conditions or to live with them better and to have better quality of life without the need of health or social care. We are delighted, therefore, to be running this workshop today. And key for us is that we share best practice and key learnings, um, and that's the aim of of our webinar today. As time is tight, um, I'm just going to get on and introduce our first speaker. So Nikita Rowley is our behaviour change specialist with lots of experience for exercise referral schemes. She's run, run some in, in the past. So I'm going to stop sharing. Over to you, Nikita. Thank you. Thank you, Sharla. OK, so can you see my slide, Sharla? Uh, it's, I think it's coming. Oh, yeah, there we go. Got yeah. it. Thank you. <clears throat> OK, brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so my name is Nikita Rowley. Um, a little bit about my background. Um, so I have over 15 years experience in exercise referral settings. Um, it first started um, 15 years ago when I was on work experience, I was working within an exercise referral scheme and I just thought it was amazing to see how we could use physical activity to um, improve someone's health conditions. And from there, I just had the bug. Um, I would volunteer at various schemes um, and then sort of work my way up through leisure centres, um, getting all my qualifications. Um, experience specifically to exercise referral, um, designed, developed and implemented new schemes. Um, I've supported uh, scheme coordinators to redesign schemes, especially with that behaviour change element. Um, and then evaluated schemes at a local and a national level. Um, my PhD, so I completed my PhD in 2019, um, and this was sort of looking at exercise referral from a national perspective. Um, so the title of that was Exercise Referral Schemes in the UK, Initial Observations from the National Referral Database. And that was in collaboration with UK Active and Referral, who owned the, the National Referral Database. 
Um, I'm also a chartered psychologist and a behaviour change specialist. So I have a lot of experience of applying behaviour change, theoretical frameworks to the development of interventions in public health settings, as well as in the field of physical activity, exercise and health. Um, I'm currently based at Coventry University, where I'm a lecturer. I'm also a researcher and a course director. OK, so um, why are they important? Why are exercise referral schemes important? I'm sure you are all aware of this, um, but I'll just go through these few points anyway. So exercise referral has been around since the early 1990s with the aim to increase individuals physical activity levels on the basis that physical activity has a range of positive health benefits. And I'm sure you've all witnessed them um, yourselves firsthand. Um, looking at the number of schemes in the UK, so this is a little bit trickier to, to sort of pin down, but back in 2011, um, Pavey et al, um, a group of researchers, um, estimated that there's around 800 schemes. More recently, uh, researchers uh, Jane and Downey um, sort of had a mapping ex exercise and they um, sort of come up to around 625 schemes, but the exact number of schemes in the UK is kind of unknown. Um, so, as we know, exercise referral is a popular way to promote being active um, by providing patients uh, or clients with an introduction to being physically active, which could act as a facilitator for long term behaviour change with the aim of preventing or managing health conditions. So let's look at how they can actually improve physical activity levels. So previous research has found that actually um, it's quite inadequate, that actually physical activity levels may not be increasing. Uh, this may be due to little research actually measuring physical activity levels. So as part of my PhD, I had this amazing database from referral, had data from across the whole of the UK. I thought, one of the main studies that we should focus on is actually just physical activity increase um, through physical activity participation through exercise referral schemes. And what we found was that exercise referral may not be targeting the right population for which they're aimed for. So we know that exercise referral is typically aimed at people that are inactive, for people that have long term health conditions and want to see an improvement in those conditions. What we did find was that participants are typically classified as moderately active prior to beginning their exercise prescription. Or the other reason why we were finding that they were reporting uh, moder moderately active, this was through the IPAC questionnaire. Um, it could be that participants were actually overestimating their physical activity levels. So maybe they weren't being um, fully truthful in terms of the physical activity levels that they were they were putting down on the IPAC to begin with. What we did find, though, that exercise referral schemes are associated with a significant change in total physical activity levels. So most of this was accounted for by an increase in the moderate to vigorous physical activity. And we found that this increased around 70 minutes um, and 29 minutes per week. What we also found was that participating within a exercise referral scheme um, when they completed their IPAC at baseline and then at completion, um, that we did see a reduction in sitting time of around an hour per week, which is amazing. Um, however, the size of these changes were not sufficient for participants to move from moderately active to that highly active category. So this sort of um, sort of led to these questions at the bottom. So are schemes actually targeting those who are most inactive? Or are participants actually overestimating their physical activity levels at baseline? So I'll let you have a little think about those for now. Um, Based off my PhD, um, there were several recommendations. My PhD um, thesis has been published and you can access that online if you wanted to. Um, but a couple of these different um, recommendations uh, we're going to go through now. So the first one is looking at the referral pathway. So if you look at the left of the slide, we have the tradi traditional approach to the referral pathway. So typically a GP refers a patient to a local exercise referral scheme. The exercise referral lead will then content, contact the patient to set up an induction. That person will then attend the induction. 
which will then lead on to um, a 12 week ex exercise prescription designed by an exercise specialist, which is given to the patient. They would then attend weekly sessions. There may be a midpoint check in where they may check physical activity levels or any other measures that they're focusing on, um, make sure that the program's working for them and then allow that person to then continue the final half of their program which then leads to completion. Uh, for some people, they may continue to be active and others may stop. So we want to look at changing the approach to the referral pathway. And I'm just gonna give you some ideas on how this can be done. There's a whole host of ways that this can be done, but we'll just touch on a few of these for now. So looking at that first point, GP refers patients to a local exercise referral scheme. Typically, very historically, it would be a GP that refers an individual to the scheme, but it's really about how can we change um, this approach? So allowing other referrers to refer in. Um, another study that I published from my PhD was looking at um, the type of referrers into schemes, and it was quite eye-opening actually. So it wasn't just predominantly GPs. We found that physiotherapists were referring people to an exercise referral scheme. We had healthcare assistants, we had nurses, we also had pharmacists, although it was only a small number, but they were allowed to refer people to these schemes. So increasing the um, sort of the referral pathway, who can refer into a scheme, may then allow more people to access um, these schemes. And then another one is self-referral. Uh, now, I know some people um, are not sure whether we should be allowing people to self-refer, um, but if we have a link worker in the middle where they contact the patient who has self-referred, they may need to ask um, a further few more questions to see if they're eligible. But at least then we're hopefully targeting other people who maybe don't see healthcare professionals, don't go to their GP um, and they can refer themselves in. So moving on, on to that next point. So exercise referral lead contacts patient. Um, now we're seeing uh, an increase in social prescribers. So can we use those as a way to refer people into exercise referral, um, along with maybe potential link workers? We then have that induction. So typically you would have an individual come in for their induction. You may ask them a series of questionnaires um, to make sure that they're eligible, that they're safe to exercise, check out their current physical activity levels. Um, but I think it's really important that instead of just providing them with this um, sort of maybe generalised exercise prescription in a gym, it's really important that we take into consideration their preferences to the type of activity. Now, if we're targeting people that are inactive, they may be individuals that don't want to be in a gym or are quite scared or there may be stigma about going into the gym. So it's really important to take into consideration their preferences in terms of activity. It's really important to provide a personalised approach. Now, I know this can be quite difficult, um, especially when we're trying to standardise everything. So when I was looking at the data in the referral database during my PhD, it was quite clear that everyone, every scheme were collecting different types of data. So some people were collecting data around physical activity, looking at the IPAC, some were using the GPAC. And it's really important that we can, um, as a researcher, we can evaluate nationally as long as everyone is using the same type of standardised approach. And this is something I'll go on to later. And it's really important as well that we're evaluating outcomes that are related to the condition they're referred with. So if they're referred for um, maybe an MSK injury or they've had hip replacement and they're now um, through to the exercise referral, um, if we're measuring blood pressure, what does that mean in terms of their MSK condition? How are we evaluating any change in maybe their mobility, uh, the range of movement? So it's really important to make sure that we are evaluating those related outcomes. So we move on to now another recommendation of expanding the offer. So changing the approach to the offer. So um, as we can see here, typically, um, if you look at the literature, uh, most commonly it's a 12 week exercise prescription. But actually, the length of the program may need to change depending on the referral reason. So if somebody was referred with maybe high blood pressure, looking at the evidence, a four week program actually provides sufficient change in blood pressure. If we're looking at something, maybe a mental health condition or maybe an MSK condition, they may need a bit longer than 12 weeks. 
looking at environment as well so can we open it up in terms of environment so does it have to be based in a, a gym does it have to be based in a fitness studio could it be outdoors and this then links to the range of activities so could it be linking to maybe a walking club could it be linked to walking football could it be linked to maybe um tennis looking at how we expand the offer going beyond a exercise prescription just in the gym how can we provide more of more of an offering to these clients these patients so maybe it will tempt them in in terms of maybe participating adhering longer because they're doing an activity they enjoy um, traditionally it'd be a weekly session with an exercise specialist um, looking at the number of sessions so it could be still having a weekly session with an exercise specialist but are they allowed to attend other sessions where they can maybe go and play badminton or go and do walking football and is this the this recorded within their prescription Looking at types of support, so in person is very traditional. I think during COVID, we started to see um, more of these schemes offer a virtual support um, network to clients, which is good. Um, but then also focusing on social support. So as well as getting support from an exercise specialist, how can we entice, um, say, the patient, the client to get um, support from maybe family or friends or from other people that are going through um, their exercise prescription as well. So it's looking at trying to expand what we already offer to provide more, uh, maybe more of a holistic approach to, to, to physical activity rather than just focusing on that exercise approach. And then what's really important is um, a focus on changing behaviour. <clears throat> so Throughout the referral pathway, behaviour change techniques can be embedded, but I'm just going to focus on two elements for today. So looking at attending the induction. Now, we know from the literature, from the data that I've looked at, from first-hand work with exercise referral, we have so many people that will attend an induction and then they won't attend any more sessions. So they kind of just drop out from there. But why are they doing this? Do you follow up on that? I think it's really important that we look at those who don't attend or maybe those who stop halfway through and figure out why they stopped and how we can try and use behaviour change techniques to enhance them back in or to stop them from dropping out altogether. <clears throat> so there's a couple of behaviour change techniques here that have been used um, that I've implemented within schemes. Um, so if we're looking at induction, we may want to look at including a behavioural contract. So getting the individual to write up a contract of maybe saying that they're going to attend X amount of sessions over X amount of weeks and they sign it. You're putting that onus on to the individual to take responsibility for their own adherence. Talk about the benefits of changing behaviour in terms of maybe their health condition, how they'll feel mentally, um, maybe the physiological changes that they'll start to see. Provide them with information about health consequences. So if you don't uh, change your behaviour or if you don't get more physically active, these are the things that may happen. <clears throat> and then look at restructuring the physical environment. So this may relate more to home based exercise. So you may provide an individual with a prescription to do within a gym, whether it's walking, maybe it's some sort of other activity. But do we focus on what they can do at home? So maybe the home based exercise programme stuff. So I'll go on to that in a little bit. Moving on to the prescription, here's just a, a few behaviour change techniques that, that I've seen that have worked. So looking at focusing on habit formation, so being more physically active, what is actually feasible for that individual and how can we create that habit? Evaluate outcomes related to the condition referred with, as I've mentioned before. Providing social support and then looking at any discrepancy between their current behaviour, so what they're doing right now, so maybe not being physically active, being quite sedentary, and their goal of maybe increasing physical activity to maybe um, three, four hours a week, um, reducing sedentary time. Um, so looking at that discrepancy and making that known to the individual. <clears throat> So just a few quick key takeaways. You want to make your exercise referral scheme as attractive as possible. Guidance in terms of how we create an exercise referral, how we deliver it, it goes beyond the nice exercise referral guidelines. There's all sorts of different uh, guidelines out there. There's a lot of literature out there. 
Evaluation is key. It shows your scheme's worth. It's really important that you are evaluating each of the individuals that come through your scheme. We know that a standardised approach is required, but also a personalised approach is required. So we don't want to be giving the same prescription out to every individual. We want to take into consideration the condition that they're referred with and also their preference to exercise. We want to widen the offer, so offer a range of activities. So we're starting to see schemes move away from that traditional exercise referral scheme and open it up to a physical activity referral scheme, as we know that physical activity is kind of an umbrella term and that would cover a lot of different types of structured exercises and physical activities um, themselves. Different referral routes into your scheme, so offering that traditional GP referral, maybe open it up to healthcare professionals in the area, so maybe your pharmacists as well, um, and also that self-referral. And it doesn't have to just be based in a leisure environment. The key one for me is that focus on behaviour change. Um, so change needs to be sustainable um, and we want to focus on prevention rather than just treatment. And that also supports the NHS long term plan. Get support from behaviour change specialists. Um, if you don't know um, how to um, apply behaviour change techniques, you don't have a behaviour change specialist within the team, reach out to specialists. Um, and make use, if you do want to attempt, of the behaviour change uh, technique taxonomy version one. Um, that provides you with a whole list of behaviour change techniques. Um, ideally, if you can get behaviour change specialists involved, you would then use the behaviour change wheel and they would support you to use this framework to develop a better, more sustainable scheme that would focus on behaviour change. Um, there's a couple of um, publications here from my PhD at the top and then more recently home based exercise um, all the links are there if you want to go check them out. They may provide you with a bit more insight in terms of the research, looking at data more from a national point of view. Um, so yeah, go check those out. So some of the future work really quickly that I'm working on is the development of a physical activity for health pathway, um, developing a framework in collaboration with MOVE Consulting, uh, with funding from Active Partnerships and Sport England, um, exploring ways to update the National Exercise Referral guide, like Guidance. As we know, um, the NICE guidelines from 2014 are now kind of outdated. They don't provide enough detail in terms of maybe the prescriptions we should be be prescribing for different health conditions. So that's something that I am sort of trying to work on. Um, continuing my work on the home based exercise programs for people living with overweight and obesity. So I know that's a little bit more specialised uh, in terms of a health condition, uh, but looking at how we can offer prescriptions in a home setting. I'm also providing support in terms of redesigning and developing uh, physical activity referral schemes at local levels. And if anyone is interested, I am in the process of developing a knowledge exchange event that focuses on exercise, physical activity referral, getting researchers, people that may be commissioned schemes, that work in schemes together so they can understand what is going on within the research world. How can we improve these schemes and take them forward? So thank you for your time. Um, if anybody do need support with redesigning their scheme, maybe advice on how to incorporate behaviour change techniques, uh, want to explore how to redesign your scheme based on the latest evidence, please do get in touch. There's my email, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram. So yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Nikita. So much information there. Um, no time for questions, I'm afraid. So if you do have questions for Nikita, please just do put it in the chat and I'm sure she'll be happy to, to answer them. I'm going to hand, hand over swiftly to Daniel Leveson um, and Richard Claydon, both from Oxfordshire who've been involved in their exercise referral scheme, which is a county-wide one, really exciting thing. So over to you, thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Hopefully everyone can hear me and Rich is uh, sharing the slides. He's somewhere, that means he's, he is yeah, somewhere okay. in the background. Fantastic. Uh, so yeah, thanks very much uh, for the introduction. My name's Dan Leveson. I'm place director for Oxfordshire part of the Buckinghamshire, Oxfordshire and Berkshire West Integrated Care Board. Effectively, I'm responsible for 
convening the leadership from health and social care in Oxfordshire, so across local authority, NHS, voluntary sector, public health, general practice, uh, and finding new ways of delivering different care or more joined up care for populations and focusing more on reducing inequalities and prevention. So Rich, if you can move on to the next slide. Um, so, so the program that we're talking about is Oxfordshire on the move and it is genuinely, we've designed a, a whole system approach to activity like Nikita was saying. I think we are moving away from ex exercise and much more to uh, activity. Um, it's it's a, a real joint effort, so it involves public health funding. We have city and district councils involved and, and funding particular posts, voluntary community sector communities and the integrated care board, which I'll talk more about our involvement uh, as we move through. But some of the context for you, about 9% of not to four year olds meet the, the chief medical officer guidelines for physical activity uh, nationally. Over 3000 older people in Oxfordshire are hospitalized due to falls every year. So we know that and that's one of the populations that we're trying to support more uh, to be more active and reduce the falls. 137,000 people of all ages live with two or more long term conditions in Oxfordshire um, and 45,000 school aged children don't meet the, the chief medical officer guidelines for physical activity. So um, there's lots of evidence around the need to be more active and then the other thing that I don't think uh, I'm assuming many people on this call will be need convincing of is uh, being more active is better for people's physical and mental well-being and that's part of our, our reason for doing the right thing. So uh, Rich if you can move on. Next slide please, uh, there we go. Um, uh, so why we fund it and how we fund it, we've got like most integrated care boards, we got two years uh, funding for inequalities. It's a relatively small amount of funding. So we have an annual budget in the integrated care board of about 3.3 billion pounds. And we got about 7 million pounds each year for, for uh, inequalities that equated to about one and a half million pounds for us in Oxfordshire. Uh, each year for two years. So we had three million pounds. Um, we saw it as an opportunity to think differently about how we use NHS funding. We saw it as an opportunity to focus on inequalities, particularly people living with long term conditions, particularly people living in deprived areas, particularly families uh, in receipt of uh, free school meals uh, and people like that. Um, and we also saw it as an opportunity to uh, focus more on the building blocks of health. So the wider determinants of health, bearing in mind that from an NHS point of view, we probably contribute 20 percent to people's health outcomes. The rest is where they live, who they know, the environment that they live in, uh, the social activities that they have access to. So we really saw it as an opportunity to do more on that. Some of the outcomes that we're looking for. Ideally, we want a population that's more active. Uh, some of the stuff that Nikita was saying earlier as well, this is really linking with other things that are around. So social prescribing, the community work that we already have, in, have going on, the, the leisure facilities, the green spaces, Active Oxfordshire was a natural organisation for me to work with and through because they seem to be able to coordinate lots of our activity across the whole county. They're also responsible for our active travel uh, work in the county so there's a real opportunity to link some of these things up um, and as a result of this but in combination of other things that we're doing really the outcomes that I'm looking for and this is the kind of the thinking much more holistic about what we're we're doing is we want the children in our children in our county to spend more time at school and attain uh, and achieve better results at school we want adults to be healthier and spend more time in work so they're contributing they're fulfilling they're able to one of the things that we've heard when we talk to most of our populations is the cost of living is a, is a challenge for them and part of that will be their their health and well-being so helping them being more active and therefore being spending more time in employment and then finally for older people we want them to spend more time at home that means less time in hospital and away from home um, so those are the outcomes that we're looking for and I'm less and I've rich and I have talked a lot about this and I've 
spent a lot of my time. I think the business cases that I see written that say, if you invest in this, you will save X million of pounds in uh, avoided appointments or something else. It, I don't think those business cases really work these days. And so I think we just need to think uh, much more holistically about that because in reality, I can't really take millions of pounds out of most of our acute hospitals. Um, Rich, I'll hand over to you for the for the detail. Excellent. Thanks, Dan. Uh, hi, everyone. So my name is Richard Claydon and I'm the strategic health lead at Active Oxfordshire. So my area of work is really focusing on tackling inactivity and inequalities for older adults, those living with long term health conditions, adults at risk of falls um, and those who have challenges with their mental health. So Dan's already mentioned this real this collaborative approach that's taken place in Oxfordshire to, to create this physical activity pathway. And this is one of um, many sort of interventions that are part of the Oxfordshire on the move whole systems approach to physical activity. So the most applicable for today's session is obviously move together in terms of that physical activity referral pathway. Um, I'm just going to talk about you know, the strengths of it, really, um, look at some of the outcomes and some of our learning throughout this presentation. Um, I think the key thing that we found is that the behaviour change elements that Nikita touched on are really um, evident in Move Together. Um, we work with district councils, so Active Oxford's role is to essentially coordinate Move Together and it's delivered at each district council by coordinators in each place. So very much a nice countywide approach from our side, but also real place based in each district, having that, that impact locally and knowing what, what works for individuals and what's available in their area as well. The behaviour change support was provided throughout um, and they get signposted to relevant activities, but it's really about being personalised um, and looking at the person's needs and preferences and trying to support them on a journey to being more active, but also encouraging them to be able to stay active and, and sustain that activity levels ongoing. The visual on the right hand side is just really um, explains the journey of the support that's provided. So we currently have a referral set up where we've got referrals from healthcare, but also a self referral option. We're set up in the, G the GP's EMIS system, so we can get referrals straight through to a secure NHS.net account from GPs. Health, uh, the wider healthcare professionals can also refer into Move Together using our, our referral form on the website. And obviously there's an option to self-refer and even the phone calls for those people who, who aren't that keen on using the, the digital form, um, referral form. We're currently we're seeing about 60% of our referrals coming from healthcare. Um, so we're really embedded in not only primary care, but wider services that are very much condition specific. And those referrals will land into an inbox uh, database that the coordinators use on a daily basis and they will contact um, that individual and begin the conversations about what their needs are, what their preferences are, what they want to achieve. And this is where the behaviour change journey really kicks in. Um, we do an initial assessment, which is also a really good opportunity to gather data on that, that person's baseline data to then support our evaluation. And then they receive follow ups over a three month stage. So. For some people, that might be one follow up. For others, it might be three. It's very much personalised to the needs of that person. And there'll be signposted activities to try throughout, which I'll come on to in terms of the, the range of activities in a second. And the ideal is that we get to the three month stage and, and those individuals are have the tools, they have the knowledge and they have the confidence to continue being active themselves. Um, and that does happen a lot. So we do have some people that we continue supporting for a variety of different circumstances, but essentially they receive that personalised support and they, they we've got some good outcomes of how they then continue being active after that and the impact that it has had. So in terms of the range of activities, so each district has a database and an activity um, internally facing activity database they can use and they can populate to support people. And it's very much having this this combined leisure and community offer. So really trying to meet people at what their needs are. And you can see the whole variety there. So walking is increasingly popular activity choice. We're still referring on to exercise referral for that condition specific support in gyms and th through leisure. But there's a whole variety from seated exercise um, to strength and balance classes linking with Age UK. We're doing a lot, we're seeing a lot of popularity in home activity packs. So lots of um, people are happy to have resources that they can start moving at home due to some of their mobility issues or some complexity to their health. It, you know, it supports them to move more in a way that works for them. So it's really, really vast. Um, we keep updating our database so that we can then have that direct signposting from the conversations that are taking place but really it's about being personalized and creating as much variety as possible the home visits might um, jump out at some people it's something we've tried over the last year and a half and it's really trying to have an approach where we can allow people to, to move more in a home but obviously improve their confidence to eventually engage with some of those sessions are in the community and we're actually going to pilot something starting in June July this year of Age UK where it's going to be specifically a targo based home visit supporting people with risk of falls to improve their activity and, and move more. 
So some of the outcomes, this is from our latest report. So from 2000, um, for January 2023 to December, um, just over 2,000 referrals were made during that time period. We've seen 94% of participants who have an initial assessment continue with the pathway, which I think really reinforces the fact that the support provided by coordinators is really valued and supports them in that journey to be more active. 76% of at least one long one long term health condition and 74% are, are inactive. So again, reinforcing that we are we're meeting the, the needs of the pathway. 60% of participants increased their activity levels and those who did increase was by an average of 45 minutes a day. 54% of participants reported the perception of the health had improved. And a really nice one is that 93% of participants would recommend move together. So a lot of this is captured from the baseline data we get on the initial assessment and then a three month review at that three month review stage. Just delving into that slightly more, so 70% of participants provided positive health benefits. So things like improved strength, balance, confidence, mobility, and losing weight and sleeping better. Um, similar 59% were specifically noted um, improvements in their mental health. So improved confidence, sense of achievement, reductions in isolation and improved mood. And then 77% reported having positive changes to their lifestyle. So things like changing in their attitudes towards physical activity. Bit of qualitative data for you as well. So we've got a wide range of, of case studies, quotes that cover many different circumstances. I think what comes out, what comes out of these for me is that everyone's circumstance is very different and the support and activities on offer is vital to get them to that point of, in, of increasing their activity levels. So the role the coordinator is playing in being personalised and finding an activity that's fit for them is is vital, but also we get a lot of words like encouragement, motivation, support that come out of our quality quotes, which just show that role and how important it is. Just going to quickly go through some of the learning and recommendations that we've found. So I've said it a lot throughout the presentation, taking a behaviour change approach and being person centred is is vital in to increasing activity, um, helping them feel supported and, and giving them the tool to continue being active. The wide activity offer has been huge for us in terms of the take up and, and allowing people to have confidence in trying something. Some people are put off by gyms and leisure centres, some people aren't, but giving them that option is really important and the home visits is a really good example of that. Having a simplified activity pathway is really important, especially for healthcare professionals. The amount of times I hear from GPs saying we just don't know what is going on out there and what programmes are available, or we're saying to them, well, we'll do that triage, we'll do that conversation and we'll tell them what's available and support that person to increase their activity, which I think, again, is really valued. In terms of recommendations, and, and Dan's touching it, having that collective system wide vision around the important role that physical activity plays um, is vital. And we've been so grateful for the support because it's allowed us to, to plan longer term and to put some of the learning and game plan evaluation into place. So that's a really, really important piece of work. The evaluation, I know Nikita touched on that, that has been huge for us to be able to, to demonstrate the impact we're having, um, to demonstrate the learning of the, the pathway to take things forward and make sure we're reaching other groups where that's not happening so well. We're not doing everything perfectly. There's always learning to be to be had and we need to change things as we go through to make sure it works effectively. And then the alignment with the physical activity pathways for health. And again, Nikita touched on that and we're going to be very much involved in that. We were part of a um, a place based face to face event to get insight from healthcare professionals in terms of what a, a good physical activity pathway looks like. And we will continue that doing forward and we'll shape it alongside Move Together and the work we're doing there. That's all from me and from Dan. And I've, I'll put my email on there. So if you've got any specific questions related to um, Move Together, please do get in touch. The web link there will take you to more information again, but also to a video which brings to life what I've said today in the presentation. So Please take a look at the video because I think it does a really good job in in reinforcing what we're doing with Move Together. Thank you so much, Dan and Richard. Again, so much information in such a short amount of time. Um, if you've got questions, please that you want answered now, please do put it into the chat. Um, so much I could ask, but I think we'll have to leave it now. And um, we're going to move on, and I am going to pass over to Abigail. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, so as we're here for an exercise referral webinar and talking a lot about activity and movement, uh, we thought we'd get everyone up for a minute or two. Um, so we're going to do something called the sit to stand test. Um, some of you may be aware of it. Um, it was originally designed to test leg strength and endurance in older people, but it can be used across populations. So Firstly, please only take part if you feel comfortable and you're able to do so. We don't want any injuries, but essentially you're going to um, start sitting down. 
uh, feet firmly on the floor with your arms crossed across your chest. And we're going to do as many sit to stand in a period of 30 seconds. So, um, yeah, you can have a look at your score and try and beat your uh, beat your score next time. So if you are on a typical desk chair with wheels, please be extra careful. Um, like I said, we don't want any injuries. Um, Maybe better to place it against a wall. So we'll start the timer. OK, three, two, one, let's go. Halfway through. Three, two, one, and stop. OK, there you go. I won't ask people to put their scores in the chat. You can keep those to yourself. Um, hopefully we feel a little bit more energised for the second part of the webinar. Um, so I'm now going to hand over to Kate Holler, who is the Exercise Referral Development Officer based at the YMCA. Over to you, Kate. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'll just let everyone get their breath back while I find my screen. <clears throat> right. OK, sorry for the delay, it's coming. OK, hopefully everyone can see that. So, yes, thank you for the introduction, um, Abigail. I am Kate Holer. I am um, the Exercise Referral Development Officer. I'm based at the YMCA in Redhill, um, but I'm working across East Surrey Place. Um, and East Surrey Place, for those of you who are um, unsure, is one of the four places that make up the um, Surrey Heartlands ICS. And um, ageing well um, is one of the six uh, key priorities. And it was because of this um, ageing well programme and an ageing well steering group that um, funding was made possible um, for my role, basically. Um, and the project that I'm working on was commissioned um, to support primary prevention of frailty symptoms and also to increase the uptake of exercise referral. And it has initially been funded for um, one year, um, and that is coming to the end, um, sadly, at the moment, at the end of March. So the outcomes um, for the project, um, essentially, um, it's all about increasing um, exercise referral in um, East Surrey, but also about looking at how to make the system um, more consistent. Um, across East Surrey Place. So there's several um, different leisure providers offering an exercise referral scheme, which I'll um, go into in a moment. And it's looking at how, um, how the offer can be a little bit more consistent. Also looking at um, increasing participation um, of the, the number of clients on programmes, looking at the number of locations, delivering exercise referral sessions and um, the number of specialists working um, in the field as well. Um, so that's what the project's been um, working on. Now, one of the things that um, I did right at the start was looking at what the current landscape looked like in East Surrey. And on this slide, um, I sort of tried to break down the three different leisure providers that are offering schemes in our area. Um, so we have the YMCA um, in Redhill. We have GLL, who operates in um, Rygate and Hawley it, for the um, purposes of the, the patch that I'm working on and Freedom Leisure who have um, leisure centres in Oxted and Caterham. So hopefully just by glancing at this screen you can see that there are quite a few differences in, in the offer. All, all centres have got a good offer but they, they, they are quite different. Um, you can see there's difference in prices, there's difference in how long the scheme sort of um, lasts, differences in the contact that the patient or the client would receive throughout their um, sort of traditional 12 week programme um, and then differences in what happens after the scheme comes to an end. Um, leisure providers holding the price, uh, the reduced membership, some, some were not able to do that at that time. Um, 
and again a difference in what else was offered aside from the the standard 12-week program what other options there were available um specialist classes for specialist health conditions again a big difference in in what was available so what i've been trying to do um on in in role on this project is look at how we can start to get these three um different providers working together um and how we can start to sort of make things a little bit more consistent across across the patch so one thing that we've been doing a lot of and i think it's been really successful is this partnership working and um, i think it's quite unusual to have different leisure providers sitting down together and working together um you know that sort of traditional view of, of com competition competing for clients we've we've put that aside and we've we've got some really positive working relationships um where we, we're meeting regularly the scheme coordinators from um from those leisure providers are meeting regularly and we're working as well with um regular referrers um so we've had we've had meetings with our local um social prescribers meetings with our local um physiotherapists who refer for um, msk and um cardiac and um, pulmonary um, conditions. So we're, we're regularly sharing our ideas and best practice and how we can sort of really improve the offer together for um, patients living in our area. One thing um, that we have been looking at is again sort of improving and standardizing the offer to make the process easier for those who want to refer on to the scheme. So we have looked at, um, we've sat down together and we've created a standard referral form that all um, all three providers will use across East Surrey Place, um, which will hopefully help with um, with GPs and and other referrers, rather than thinking, okay, so they want to go to Centre X, I need to download this form, um, but then the the client says, well, actually, Centre Y is more convenient for me. Ah, oh, okay, I need to start all over again. I need to find a new referral form. So we're looking at how we can um, sort of pull our ideas and create a referral form that works, but for all of the clients um, that would be referred in our area. Um, and we've also worked together to, to agree what the sort of inclusion and exclusion criteria um, will be for, for those three leisure providers. So we're all working um, to the same set of criteria. We've done a huge um, work, a huge amount of work on activity mapping. So looking at actually what is on offer aside from the standard um, programs in the gyms, what else is on offer for people living with long term conditions in our area? And part of that has also really helped highlight what what is a what is there, but also what is missing and what have we what have we um, not got? What can we not um, provide at the moment? So, for example, we've seen there's a there's a huge hole um, for patients living with cancer. We, in the area, we don't seem to have any sort of um, set cancer rehab um, or prehab sessions. So that's something we're looking to address um, really soon. Um, we've also been looking at volunteers, how we can recruit volunteers to assist on the exercise referral schemes. We recognise that um, volunteers have such a lot to offer, particularly if they've maybe been through the scheme themselves um, and they can then provide almost like a buddy system for people new to the scheme. So we're looking at um, recruiting volunteers. Um, over the last, um, since April, at the so start at the YMCA, we've we've recruited five new volunteers. So we've now gone from two to seven working across um, the scheme across the week. Uh, it's about 20 hours of support working on the specialist classes, the wellbeing gyms, um, helping people on and off the equipment, just being there, um, someone to chat to, someone to offer some experience. Um, and the idea is then we can roll out this scheme to the other providers. So hopefully within the next six months or so, we'll have volunteers working in all of the schemes. We're also working together to develop um, the instructors who are delivering um, this vital work. Um, so, for example, we've um, increased the number of people with the level three exercise referral qualification. Um, I'm trying to help upskill those who've already got that qualification. Um, so recently, um, a member of staff from Freedom Leisure, uh, the project's funded her to go on um, a boxing activator course with England Boxing, which will then enable her to deliver um, sessions, boxing specific sessions for people living with Parkinson's. Um, we've recently also funded a member of staff from um, GLL to go on an exercising with MS workshop. So it's again looking for those opportunities to upskill um, the staff across the patch rather than again working in isolation. Um, and again, we're sort of looking at how we can further develop the specialist classes um, on offer and 
specifically cancer rehab is a big priority for us and that's something we are um, really now starting to drill down into and, and get and get moving. Obviously um, the work hasn't been without challenges. Um, the, I would say the, major, the, the real big issue is time. Um, each, each leisure provider and those of you who are on the call today from leisure providers, you all know everyone's under enormous pressure. Um, so it, it's, it's finding the time to commit um, to meet and to really be able to say to prioritise this work and say this is really important as that has been a challenge. Um, funding is also um, is also a challenge. It's, it's trying to secure that ongoing commitment to the project um, and you know, I recognise that we're competing against other very worthwhile projects for funding um, and it's really it's, it's trying to really prove the worth of, of the work that we're doing. Um, and another challenge, and again, it, I think it comes from a time pressure for the GPs and the referrers, it's just getting that engagement and raising the awareness of what we're trying to offer and specifically the project. Um, so I do as much as I can, so outreaching. Yesterday I had a fantastic meeting with our local social prescribing team where they were really honest with me about actually what it's like to refer onto these schemes and, and where they can see changes that need to make be made. So, um, yeah, it's a challenge, but it's also a really positive challenge. It's great to hear actually what it is like um, and that this gives me then lots of things to work on. So sort of the next steps just to finish where we're looking to to carry on this work. So I say it's been funded so far for a year, but we think we're at a really good place at the moment. We're making some really good um, strides. So it's how to keep that going now, how to keep the appetite um, up and keep this development work going to ensure that the exercise referral offer in, in our area is, is the best that it can be and how we can really make it evolve and improve and making sure we're best meeting the needs of, of you know, our local um, community. So again, we want to just carry on improving this referral process. And I think it's been, I've got some new things to think about actually from um, Active Oxfordshire and um, Nikita Rowley, so thank you. That's been really useful to have some other new ideas popping in already. Um, so we, again, looking at how that referral process, widening the offer, how we can make sure we're getting as many people onto the scheme as possible. Um, I want to continue looking at the exit strategy. So what happens next? If it is a standard 12 week scheme, well, it, it can't just finish. What, what happens then? Where can we sort of signpost people to making sure there's lots of um, appropriate services to signpost people to afterwards? Um, I want to continue looking at how our operating procedures across the place can be consistent, looking again at pricing principles, the monitoring and the evaluation, really making sure we're tracking patients throughout their journey. Um, if people drop off, why do they drop off? Where do they drop off? What can we do about that? Using that data to really help us. Um, so that patient profiling. Obviously, it's all about increasing referrals. What are we, how are we, is this an attractive scheme? Is there more we can do to make um, make it easy for people to refer on to and for people to really feel that it's it's, it's valued and it's, it's really had a benefit to their health um, and continuing that um, engagement with the referrers, increasing participation, overcoming any of the barriers, if it, it might be cost or location and really trying hard to convert referrals um, to active users and then just carrying on with the development of specialist community classes is what all what we're trying to carry on in the future. So hopefully that's been a little bit of an insight into how um, how things are looking at the moment in East Surrey with different providers working together. I think it's um, it's been a really interesting year and I hope it's something that can continue um, in the future. So thank you very much um, for your time and I'll now stop sharing and pass you on to your next speaker. Thanks, Kate. I think we're over to um, to Will. Is it you or is it Dawn that's sharing? Yeah, I'll, I'll do the sharing if that's OK. Um, Brilliant, thanks. Me one second. Can everyone see that all OK? Perfect. Well, cool. thank you. Um, yeah, I'll start by just introducing myself quickly. So I'm Will Peer. I'm a health project officer within the health team at Active Surrey. Uh, and a large part of my role involves working directly with GP surgeries and primary care networks 
on our active practice work that we facilitate in the county, uh, which is what we're going to be talking about a little bit over the next 10 minutes or so. And in particular, the work that we've done with exercise referral, um, which it seems to be becoming a bigger part of what we do on active practices. And in running, specifically, we've been able to put a, together a bit of a pilot Sorry. offer um, and oh, been able I'm to subsidise the membership offers. Ooh. I don't know if someone's not on mute. Can but people carry put on. themselves on um, mute, please, that we can hear Will? Thank you. Sorry, Will, to interrupt you. It's all right. Um, yeah, I've also got um, Dawn from Coco PCN on the call, as well as I think Matt's made it in from the Riverbond Club as well. I know he's been busy. Um, and they're going to talk through a little bit more specifically about the exercise referral offer that we've been able to put in place um, and how that's looking in Runnymede and, and sort of what we've learned, because it is very much a pilot. Um, before I hand over to them, I do have... One quick slide of it lets me go along. Well, there we go. Um, just to give a bit of a, a broader overview about active practices. Um, it feels like I've done quite a lot of talks about active practices recently, which is brilliant, but aware that not everyone would have come across it previously as well. Um, so I wanted to just give a little bit more of context about kind of how this offer came about in active practices and, and what active practices is. So um, active practices is actually coordinated uh, on a national scale by the Royal College of General Practitioners or the RCGP. Um, and as you can see, they describe it as quite a fun and easy way that GP surgeries or primary care networks can make some pretty simple, but I think still very much impactful changes to their surgery or their primary care network um, to essentially promote physical activity, get staff and patients moving more um, and hopefully experience the, the many benefits that we know are associated with, with living a more active lifestyle. So as part of active practices with the RCGP, they actually have their own active practice charter that a GP surgery or a primary care network could sign up to. So as part of that application process, they have to demonstrate that they've taken steps towards achieving these three aims or kind of the three pillars, as I refer to them as. Um, so as you can see, these are increasing physical activity among patients and staff, reducing sedentary behaviour among patients and staff, and then also partnering with a local physical activity provider. Um, and for those first two bullet points, it's actually separated by patients and staff. So it means that for a, a practice to sort of apply and be successful, they have to demonstrate five criteria. Um, with regards to our work specifically in Surrey, there's not really a one size fits all model. Um, we've supported individual surgeries, we've supported primary care networks, and, and we've done that in a, a range of different ways, whether that be funding for equipment, whether that be facilitating training for staff about physical activity and its importance, or providing free resources such as patient text message templates or posters or waiting room videos. So there's a whole host of different things that we've done. But I think the, the thing that seems to be consistent, particularly on the patient side of things, is exercise referral. So when I have my conversations with different stakeholders, such as Dawn, such as Matt, it seems to be that exercise referral is something that we really want to promote more. Uh, and we know how beneficial it can be. It's this amazing service that's, that exists. And I think as part of active practices, there's quite a lot of overlap and some shared goals. So we were really keen to see what we could do to potentially remove some of those barriers to participation, um, increase access to exercise referral among those populations in Surrey that potentially could benefit, benefit from it the most, um, but also raise awareness among healthcare professionals as well. I know that's been mentioned in terms of not knowing potentially what is on offer and what that referral process looks like. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how this offer came about. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so I'll pass over to Dawn, if that's OK, just to go into a little bit more of the specifics about the exercise referral offer that we've been able to put in place um, in partnership with Coco PCN and the Riverbourne Club and, and kind of what that looks like. Thank you, Will. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Dawn, um, social prescriber for the Coco PCN. Um, yeah, we have been so grateful, actually, to be partnered with Active Surrey. Um, I think we met with uh, Abigail way back last year um, and we knew that one of the um, one of the key sort of assets that we have that we all have is the GP exercise referral scheme and although it was it's obviously subsidized um, I was finding still that um, patients or clients were being referred in and just still couldn't afford that cost um, so with with the help of Active Surrey, they agreed to fund 50% of the cost for the first two months, which has been has made a huge, huge difference. Um, so you know, twelve pound fifty is is really doable for most people. Um, and just to say as well, sort of following on from Nikita's um, presentation, that we really myself, the social prescribing team, um, our PR lead Pippa, um, and Active Surrey, we've really sort of banged the drum about this scheme, and we've presented to all staff, so all all practice staff, um, to try and get them to identify patients or clients that come in um, who are on a low income, struggling with their mental or physical health. Um, 
at that point they they will mention it to to the patient who then it does still go through the GP at the moment just because um, the GP kind of from a medical point of view um, sort of casts their eye over um, that patient's uh, records then it then comes back to me and I liaise with both the patient and um, Active Surrey about the scheme and really try to you know really sort of sell it to them uh, the benefits and I've I've just had such you know wonderful feedback um, I don't know if there's um, anything you want to add there Matt if you're there just to sort of say about the, the referrals we've had. Yeah I mean I think yeah, I know it was a little bit of a slow start but we're starting to see some good uptick in terms of people getting referred from yourself Dawn now um, and I think uh, yeah I think you know for us now on our, our end once you've done that hard work of getting them over to us it's how we track them and make sure we're engaging with them in the correct way to make their experience enjoyable um, and I think the key thing is then what how we keep them engaged once that three month period ends um, I think it, it, that data is key I think it'd be interesting to know from all the people, the people you refer each month, those that don't make contact with us, the reasons why as well, um, and how we can better improve our offering from our end to, to try and engage them and get them on board and take advantage of the offer. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I'm, I'm not sure if it's the next slide now, Will, I don't know. Oh, I think, we're, oh, there we go. Thank you, Will. Um, so yeah, again, just um, you know, as as Matt said, we we reject, uh, sorry, we refer people in. Um, the, I think the beauty of of the whole sort of partnership is that I am able as a social prescriber, I can follow up um, those referrals. I, I liaise with Riverborn um, to to find out, you know, have have people come in with the, with their forms and so on, and then I can then ring them. Um, and just, you know, sort of check out what the barriers might be for why they might not have got there and just sort of talk that through with them. You know, I offer face to face and um, or whatever sort of um, interactions that they would like just to see how it's all working. Um, I mean, I think, again, the, these are the, the type of people we're referring in are people who probably wouldn't have 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 um, presented to Riverborne because it just wasn't in their reach. So I think it's amazing that we're kind of that, that we're really addressing health inequalities here, which is what we what social prescribing is all about. Um, uh, I think is is this the last slide, Will? Sorry, I'm cutting. Oh, I've got one more just about I, I know Matt mentioned it about kind of the referrals we've had so far. Yeah, did you have you got another anything to add there, Matt, on on the referrals that you've had so far? No, I, no, I don't think so. I think from us as a club operator, I think the key thing, yeah, you know, I think we've chatted about this, Dawn and Abigail and, and Will before, in terms of you know, we we want to break down as many barriers to getting people engaged in wellness, whether it's in the club, outside the club, as possible. So for us, it's that learning process of, you know, we know price points a key thing, um, and we've got quite a, a range of different memberships and pay as you go, um, to even some free events we run each month. Um, so it's how we can better engage and adapt what we offer to make sure we can get as many people engaged as possible. And that's, that's key to, I think, this, this partnership and the, interest of, and the interest of how this pilot will work going forward and what we can learn. Yeah, absolutely. And um, and I think even since uh, we'll, we'll put these slides together, you know, we've uh, I know I've had about another sort of three or four in the last week. So, you know, we are yeah. really pushing it. We're really getting the word out to all staff. So they're really aware of of the scheme, which which has been brilliant. Um, and I just wanted to add as well for, through the Active Surrey partnership, um, the pedometers that um, you've really kindly provided us, of which I am wearing one right now. Um, you know, massive impacts on on people. Um, you know, taking the longer route home or to the shops rather than shortcuts. Um, and you know, really getting quite competitive with each other on on the amount of steps they do and staff as well. All of our staff, you know, can we have a pedometer? So again, that's been a huge huge input, um, which I wanted to just add as well. So thank you. I don't know if Pippa, you uh, Pippa, who's our PR lead, had anything to add as well. She's been very instrumental with the pedometers if we got time. Um, no, you've covered it all brilliantly, Dawn, but echoing about the pedometers. Yeah, thank okay. you. Thank you, all of you. That's great. I'm going to hand over to, to Abigail now for some um, last ideas and support that we can offer. Thank you. 
hopefully you can see the slides. Um, so we've got around just short of 10 minutes left. Um, so I just wanted to cover a couple of um, things in terms of what Active Surrey can support with and the offer that, that's out there. So for those that don't know, we do have um, our professionals hub, um, which sits within the Active Surrey website um, and is essentially a one stop shop for everything physical activity. Um, so you can have a look at, um, you can have it filter by the different cohorts that you're working with. So potentially if you're working with older adults or supporting adults with long term health conditions, um, there'll be lots of information in terms of upskilling and further training, uh, resources and signposting documents. So um, I haven't got time to, to go into it any more than that. But if you do um, want to have a look at it, then, then please do. Something else which, um, before I move on, we are looking to do is um, a bit more exercise on referral mapping. Um, so in the future, it's not there now. What we hope is that there will be a page dedicated to exercise on referral where you can filter potentially by borough and district um, to enable you to see what's out there and the logistics of each, each of those um, provisions. So that's something that we're looking to do in the future. Uh, moving on to our physical activity health posters. Um, these were originally designed to be placed across um, healthcare and community centres. Um, so a pack has gone out to every individual GP surgery across Surrey, which is great. We're really keen to get them into community centres as well. Um, so if you haven't received the pack um, or if you'd like them to be sent digitally, then please let us know and we can arrange that for you. Um, the focus of the posters, because it'll be quite hard to read there, um, is genuinely related to how physical activity can help reduce the risk of um, chronic conditions. So, for example, like type 2 diabetes, CBD, etc. Um, so like I said, if you haven't received any copies and you'd like a copy, let us know and we can arrange that. OK, um, this is the first exercise and referral webinar that we've actually delivered. Um, so we're really keen to get some some feedback. So um, if we could just spend the next minute or so, um, if you could use the chat function um, and cover the first one, one thing learned and then the second issues to explore further, um, because I think that this is a journey that we're, we're all on um, and hopefully we've taken, you know, we've got some really good and positive key takeaways um, to implement going forward. But if I could ask everyone to take a minute or so to populate that in the chat, that would be great. Um, and then I'm also going to stop sharing. And at the same time, I'm going to attempt to launch a poll. And we'd be really grateful for your feedback with regards to how useful you found this as well. It's all anonymous, so please be as, as honest as you can. It will be really helpful for us going forward. Just launching it now. Charlotte, if you could just let me know that you can see that. Yeah, it's up. Thank you. Perfect. So, yeah, we'll just um, We've got... just spend a minute or so. Sorry, go on, Charlotte. Yeah, sorry, just a hand up. I think it's someone called Helena. Please go it ahead. It is. And ask sorry. Um, I am not able to see the chat. It says I'm unable to load your messages as I'm not a participant in the meeting. Any suggestions? Should I leave and come back? What? What do you suggest? Hmm, good question. Let's have a look. Maybe if anyone could just uh, submit that poll, that'd be great. Yeah, sorry, who was going to say something? It's you, Kate. Uh, yeah, it's me. Sorry, I was just going to say to Charlotte and Abs, I can't join the chat either. <laughs> oh, I okay. can't either. Actually. Can anyone? Can anyone join the chat? I am. I am getting feedback, so it, it seems that it's working oh. for some and and not for others. We I will can't send Abigail a... either. It's Rebecca. You can't access it either. No. Okay. No, I can't. It just I just have a message saying chat isn't available right now. I have that too. Hmm. That, Is that no I'm not the NHS addresses? Are you all NHS addresses? Um, I'm on a Surrey County Council actually log in oh. at the moment on this and I still can't access it, um, Shyla. Some people have put some things in the chat, so um, apologies to those who can't access it. But if you've got any ideas, I would really appreciate you um, emailing us. Um, if you thought this was good and helpful, please let us know. Um, I think you've probably got the email addresses from the invite 
So sorry if you can't access the chat. Um, I'm not sure we've got the technical expertise to sort it out at the moment. Um, we've definitely got some things coming through there. Great to see the work happening in East Surrey and Riverbourne. Um, Importance of behaviour change. This is a, a something we wanted to ask people. Would you be keen on um, attending a behaviour or sending colleagues to a behaviour change course if we put one on? Um, if you can't ask, ask anything in the chat, please do just put yourself on um, speaker and just let us know if that would be something that would be of use to you, because it does feel like that could be the next step for, for a lot of people. Um, very thanks interesting, everyone Charlotte. Things. I think it would be very yeah. interesting. Thank you. You'd be interested, that'd be good. Well, we'll certainly um, try and gain some more uh, interest and then we will send emails out to everyone. I've got some thumbs up for that. So that's really helpful. Thank you. Yeah, sounds like it could be something worthwhile. Brilliant. Thank so, you, everyone. Thank Anyone thank got any other questions? I do have a question for Nikita, Charlotte, that was um, put in the, the book when. So I'm um, really conscious that we've only got a couple of minutes left. So if you are able to stay on, then please do. But if not, that's that's not a problem. And thank you so much for coming. So during the booking process, um, we asked everyone to highlight any challenges and key interests. Um, and we hope that majority of that has been covered within the last hour and 15 minutes. Um, but like I said, in the interest of time, um, there's one specific question that that came up quite a lot. Um, and that's how do you prove return on investment um, to get further funding? And I'd like to hand over to Nikita. Um, apologies, Nikita, a bit of a challenge. We've got two minutes left, but if you could could highlight anything, that, that would be really useful. Um, and like I said, if you are able to stay on, then, then please do, but no problem if not. And thank you for your time. Um, I did pop a, a comment in the chat just about how to get funding. It's really important to show your worth. Um, one great way of doing this is evaluation. Um, I know from working with, within schemes or sort of working with scheme coordinators that sometimes data isn't always inputted. So we collect data at baseline. Sometimes that midpoint data may have not been put into that Excel spreadsheet or the database. So it's really important to ensure that those who are Get gaining that data are inputting it and that you have full data sets um, showing that they're effective is in a, in a really important way of sort of showing your worth so I would really focus on evaluation how you evaluate what you are evaluating making sure that it's relevant to maybe the condition that an individual is referred for uh, but yeah if you need any more advice then just just drop me a message thanks Nikita that's great um so it's 11.14. Um, I'd just like to say a massive thank you to all of our speakers for their time and expertise. Um, it's much appreciated. And thank you to, to you all for, for taking time out of your busy schedules to attend this morning. We will send uh, the recording and the slides along with all the resources that I spoke about as well. So thank you very much and have a good rest of your week. <laughs>